Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. I really appreciate the um, organizers of uh, inviting me. This, I think, is our th my third time speaking, Dr. Hussein, and uh, so I haven't done something wrong yet. I'll try to keep up uh, with the two esteemed speakers that led before me. So I was asked to speak about SGLT2 inhibitors and HEFPEF, and so we'll be uh, trying to be specific about that. And I asked the provocative question, if you see the results, should these agents be placed in the drinking water? These are my disclosures, um, relevant specifically that I work with many of the companies that produce SGLT2 inhibitors um, in various research projects. So I was asked to speak about three uh, topics to outline the current therapeutic landscape for improving outcomes in patients with HEFPEF up until this point, review then the evidence to support the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFPEF with most recent data from clinical studies hot off the presses, and discuss how to integrate SGLT2 therapy into the care of patients with HEFPEF. So technically, no previous outcome trial in HEFPEF has been positive. Uh, he, you know, usually we say that HEFPEF is the graveyard of clinical trials. You bring your therapy that was really well, really well studied in HEFREF uh, to, to really meet its end in HEFPEF. It's been a very difficult road up until this point. And these are four classic trials uh, of various HEFPEF populations. And although TopCat maybe comes with an asterisk for various reasons that I won't get into for the purposes of this talk, and has a, I would say, lukewarm a recommendation in our guidelines, and maybe has had a renaissance in recent years, uh, technically the primary results were neutral. And this was also a, a disappointing study. This is one that we actually participated in as well at UHN and Women's College Hospital, the Paragon trial of Sucubichil valsartan, which was very promising, we thought, for HEFPEF, and even may still be promising, and has a lukewarm, again, recommendation in the guidelines actually has been approved by the FDA for indication across the spectrum of heart failure with a few, again, caveats. Uh, but Health Canada has yet to approve this uh, for the reason is that technically, again, it was an overall, just barely, but still overall neutral study. And we can discuss this again in details. I wasn't asked to speak about this particular topic, but again, it had a reduction, just narrowly missing systole significance. Um, some would say generally considered positive. We could have a debate about that. And there was, importantly though, improvement in functional status and quality of life. Nevertheless, there was a lot of attention and promise that pivoted towards the SGLT2 inhibitor story. So first we saw that in cardiovascular outcome trials of patients with type 2 diabetes, an improvement first, and maybe again by chance, in three-point major adverse cardiovascular events, which was primarily, again, uh, when we were designing these trials, focusing on atherosclerotic endpoints. But provocatively, where the real interest lies and where I think the real money was, was in the reduction in heart failure events, which was for the beginning of those trials, and then a lot of adaptive designs changed towards that as a co-primary endpoint, wasn't initially the focus of interest. It wasn't really caught a lot of us off guard. But based on the, we proposed the mechanism of action, it shouldn't have been so surprising. And so in EMPA reg outcome and then several other trials, we saw this reduction in heart failure events in patients, again, with type 2 diabetes with various cardiovascular risk. And so there was a few questions that came from that as we were thinking about and designing potential follow-up studies. Were the benefits similar in patients with and without cardiovascular disease and heart failure at baseline? And were these chance results, could these be replicated in all the other or, or other cardiovascular outcome trials? So this is a slide from our colleague, Darren McGuire, who actually was just here in Toronto just a few weeks, I think, weekend ago. And this was, again, stratifying the results of the major diabetes CV outcome trials at that point with and without patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And by this forest plot, you can see all of the results to the left favor treatment with, again, a relative risk reduction of about 30%. And you can see very consistent results in those with and without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And although they weren't very well phenotyped, as you heard from Dr. Alex over earlier, how difficult it might be, Nevertheless, in those with patients with and without heart failure baseline, the results mirror these as well. And so when we saw this duplication of CV outcome results, there was a real enthusiasm to pivot quickly towards potentially asking the question, does this reduce patients' heart failure events in patients with existing heart failure as much as prevent heart failure events? And could this also be seen in patients without diabetes? Is there anything specific about this therapy that requires patients to have diabetes since we think the mechanism of action had, was completely independent of its glucose-lowering effect? 
And so again, I give you a snapshot because the focus of this talk will be on half PEF, but again, very exciting results. There was a standing ovation in the room at the ESC when these were presented for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. DAPA-HF was the first trial to result uh, to publish, showing that we saw in the SGLT2 inhibitors on top of, again, the best standard care at that time, that in patients overall and those stratified by with or without type 2 diabetes, we saw this very consistent relative risk reduction. Of course, the absolute risk reduction was slightly enhanced in those with diabetes or slightly higher risk patient population, but you can see numbers needed to treat here of 23 and 18 respectively, very consistent results, and Mark Petrie had presented this data in JAMA about two years ago now. In the Emperor reduced trial program, we saw very similar results as well. And so then we saw SGLT2 inhib inhibition in HEFREF that now at least two studies demonstrated efficacy and safety of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFREF, and it became now and is established as the pillar of therapy, one of the four pillars of therapy in HEFREF. And so it was again with great momentum and excitement that we pivoted towards HEF-PEF trials as well, and we're very lucky now that two of those trials have completed that can inform us in terms of routine clinical practice and our guidelines. So the two trials were Emperor Preserved and Deliver. This is just a snapshot, a top line, a comparison between the patient populations, just for those who are in, inside baseball fans playing at home. Uh, so you can see that they both required you to have symptoms of heart failure. Again, in routine clinical practice, I almost think almost any patient who's being seen by a cardiologist typically has some uh, symptoms of heart failure when you really were to be provocative and to test this objectively. But nevertheless, uh, they also required cardiac structure and function changes just to be objective because we would wanted to make sure that those patients with dyspnea and exertion actually have um, signs and symptoms of heart failure. And so you can see subtle differences there. So in Deliver, they were a little bit more expansive. They tested for the first time patients with recovered ejection fraction. And we could have a debate about whether or not those patients technically had an indication or not at that time. But for many reasons, there's still a debate about that, or at least there was until Deliver. And now some of these heart failure trials with preserved ejection fraction are embracing this approach. And also you can see some subtle differences in the natriuretic peptide elevations that are required patients with and without atrial fibrillation for various reasons. And what was also provocative about Deliver compared to Emperor Preserved is that they also modified their protocol to allow for in-hospital patients who had been um, stabilized, and this is again a very hot topic that's on with few trials we can debate, I have some backup slides in the discussion period, about in-hospital initiation as being a, a place to do so after they were stabilized off IV therapies. Uh, you can see the differences there, subtle differences in BMI and EGFR, but otherwise very similar patient populations. So the first trial to present uh, their results and published in the New England Journal was Emperor Preserved with Ampliclofosin. Again, a very um, strong positive signal for the combination of heart failure hospitalizations or CV death, a 21% relative risk reduction, an absolute risk reduction of about 3.3%, number needed to treat about 30, median follow-up there of about two years, and you can see that, again, these curves separate nicely. In fact, they separated so early that they actually show a difference already by the 18th day of treatment that was statistically significant. And uh, DELIVER, which was the DAPICAL flows in program, showed a very similar result. Again, a very nice difference there, hazard ratio of about 20%, with an absolute risk reduction that it translated into a number needed to treat of 32 patients, very consistent with the Emperor preserved uh, um, trial results. And Muthu, Vagan, and Athens just published in JAMA Cardiology just this last week. A very nice lasso plot, similar to what Emperor Preserve showed. And you can see on the left-hand side that they looked, again, on the instantaneous daily hazard ratio across the trial as they were recruiting. And then on the right-hand side, blown up into the first 30 days, these smooth plots show you the confidence intervals in the light gray and the point estimates in the dark blue. That again, by the 13th day of treatment, the statistical significance was there that the hazard ratio was reducing the treatment, uh, re reduced the uh, primary endpoint by half, which is really exciting. Of course, there's regression to what eventually became the mean or the truth of that 18% uh, relative risk reduction, but really provocative and really exciting results, um, you, you know, and consistent with the diabetes CV outcome trials where we saw the separation of those curves very early on in those trials as well, and why there's so much enthusiasm for considering initiation in hospital. When they combined the results with DAPA-HF, I showed you earlier those with reduced ejection fraction because there was some question of heterogeneity in the Emperor program, uh, there looks to be very consistent treatment effects almost to the very high end of the LV ejection fraction spectrum. Again, re when you combine them between the two trials, a very consistent, again, 20% relative risk reduction um, with very strong confidence. 
How about safety? So again, we learned a lot from the diabetes program, but again, important to look at this in the heart failure patient population as well. And overall, what's really encouraging is that actually in the treatment arm, in the empagliflozin arm, there was actually numerically lower risks of adverse events and serious adverse events. But importantly, things that I counsel our patients on is look out for hypotension. It's part of, again, how this mechanism of action works with sodium excretion. Uh, slightly increased risk there, and also genital urinary infections, mycotic infections, as I tell my patients in the clinic, when you pee sugar in the urine, that's a universal food source, including for bacteria and for fungus in particular, and so it's important to watch out for daily hygiene there to reduce the risk of mycotic infection. And a similar uh, results were seen in Deliver. In fact, they were able to convince the regulatory agencies that this is now becoming an established therapy, very mature therapy with a good safety profile. So they were very limited in terms of their safety collection. And you can see no signals there on those major events, and particularly vascular events, for a difference between the two groups. So in terms of uh, prescribing guidance, so I like this slide. Uh, shows you, again, the guidance that Dr. Cherney and I in our care clinic, our multidisciplinary renal, um, endocrine, and cardiology clinic use when using these agents across the spectrum of kidney function. And really now with the chronic kidney disease patient population trials that we also have seen benefit for both renal reduction and CV risk reduction, we feel pretty liberal down to a GFR of 45 that you can initiate specifically EMPA and DAPA, one-time dose at 10 milligrams, start and you can just continue with routine monitoring. It's fantastic in that way, and the safety profile in those trials now of hundreds of thousands of patients justifies this. In those who are slightly lower GFR, we ask a little bit more caution in terms of being a little bit more uh, frequent in monitoring for kidney function. And I think that the you know, EMPA flows in label there of contraindicated will soon change now based on the heels of the EMPA kidney results that you can likely continue these agents if initiated at a higher GFR, all the way down, frankly, to lower GFRs their relative functional um, ability to improve uh, both heart failure and kidney function uh, stay consistent in the clinical outcome studies, although the mechanism likely is diminished in terms of its efficacy with no increased risk of safety um, concerns, even at those low GFRs. So the uh, Canadian Heart Failure Guidelines have come out with this nice algorithm for consideration of indications in those with and without diabetes, heart failure, and chronic kidney disease now and when you would be, uh, what would be contraindications, so that's chronic limb ischemia, those with, again, those very low GFRs, those with an allergy, and those that you would be a little bit more cautious, and I would add on to this list those patients who are on insulin, particularly insulin, I would be uh, working in conjunction with, a with our endocrinologist, especially with those with type 2 diabetes, but otherwise those without diabetes, um, you should be looking out for these particular acute illness, volume depletion, uh, hypotension, um, those with a history of DKA, I'd be a little bit more cautious. Otherwise, it's pretty easy to start at these uh, fixed doses. We have gone down to the DAPA glyphosin, does have a five milligram uh, also tablet, which you can use in those with lower GFRs. Monitor for mycotic infections, um, look for uh, indications for a, a drug holiday or a pause, and that's really nicely articulated in the diabetes guidelines and the sad man's um, uh, algorithm of certain agents, including now SGLT2 inhibitors. You can watch their for renal function. You should expect a bump up of about 20% in creatinine or uh, lowering in GFR. And watch for some drug drug background, so particularly modulation of diuretics if you wish. And as I mentioned earlier in type 2 diabetes, modulation of, of insulin, and I should mention also sulfonylureics in terms of hypoglycemia. But really, for the most part, it's pretty easy. And we've used this pretty routinely in clinic. And you can watch, the, you'll see some weight loss. Uh, watch, again, the blood pressure. Um, obviously, check for adherence. And as I mentioned, don't overreact to the change in renal function. Be acknowledging that that can happen. So to simplify it, just watch out for history of ketoacidosis, acute illness, and periods of fasting, such as a perioperative state, the low GFR. And there's some debate about whether those patients with high ejection fractions who may not be a typical HFPEF patient may be appropriate for therapy. So filling this evidence gap, you can see here on across the spectrum now of patients with heart failure, as this had historically been described as those at risk, those with uh, structural heart disease, um, those with heart failure, then chronic heart failure preserved or reduced ejection fraction, and then provocatively those who are acutely hospitalized with worsening heart failure. We're starting to see here from the trial um, images here an accruing of evidence. 
I think there's still some evidence to be accrued in terms of a, the acute heart failure patient population. I know that there's a lot of enthusiasm, especially at our own institutions for this and the right patient population, but I think it's important to definitively determine the efficacy and safety in the impossible setting. And there are a few trials that are still ongoing. And in those with acute heart attack now, there's two trials ongoing, one of which I'm uh, helping to lead, the Impact MI and DAPA MI respectively, that will helpful, uh, hopefully uh, give us more evidence with regards to those who are very high risk for heart failure after their acute MI. And then we could even ask the provocative question, which isn't even on the screen to the left of the first bar, is what about the very low risk patient populations? I, I started the talk with whether it should be in the drinking water and whether or not we should consider these agents in patients with hypertension or patients with diabetes without multiple risk factors. Uh, these are questions that I think would require, I think, governmental agency support. I don't think that these uh, trial manufacturers are gonna be in that game. But we've seen that with ALHAD and other antihypertensives and primary prevention trials, and I think it's a question worthwhile addressing. So in summary, there's been some prior disappointing outcome trial results with HEFPEFs, with many of our prior drugs that have been shown to be efficacious in HEFREF. But now we have accumulating evidence of heart failure benefit in the SGLT2 inhibitor uh, therapeutics. Both those who are at risk, as I mentioned, diabetes with and without atherosclerotic disease, now chronic heart failure across the spectrum of ejection fraction, and those with recent worsening or acute heart failure, which we maybe we can talk about during the discussion, as well as obviously, and we didn't focus on today, those with chronic kidney disease. SGLT2 inhibitors have a safety, a good safety profile, common sense in terms of initiation, as I mentioned, in terms of those considerations, and be uh, expecting an EGFR drop, don't overreact to that. And the timing of introduction can be consistent with other therapies. I don't think it's crucial in terms of the order. And again, there's other studies testing that in a randomized way, the order, whether it matters in terms of getting to the guideline directed medical therapy, optimal medical therapy, um, in terms of establishing efficacy and safety to initiate in hospital, there's ongoing studies. And I uh, appreciate your attention. Hope, look forward to the discussion.